torture as well as its treatment of prisoners and people. And I'm told that if this museum were in Tokyo, that they would not be able to stay open, that they would be attacked by the right-wing thug organizations that exist in Japan. Well, uh, Peter was involved in the Smithsonian. I have to remind you of the Smithsonian Institute. There was a huge scandal in 1995 to have an exhibit on the Enola Gay. Uh, they objected to uh, various things that Peter and his people were trying to put into the exhibit, like the, uh, the lunchbox, uh, sh uh, the melted lunchbox that you see at Hiroshima. They wouldn't allow that, and they wouldn't allow any... They, they said it was a disgrace to U.S. veterans. This is the kind of mentality. What we need in the U.S. is a simple museum like in Nagasaki, like the atomic museum that I saw there. It explains nuclear weapons, the amounts, the maps, what a nuclear weapon looks like. It has a... It shows you the size and the shape of the uh, plutonium bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. It gives a, a young person a real look into the power of the bomb, and it's a beautiful... We don't even have a nuclear museum in the U.S. As far as I know, Dayton, Ohio, Peter told me, there's a, there's a uh, museum in Dayton, Ohio, with boxcar, which is a plane. But there's no knowledge about what nuclear warfare can do. And, I, and in reference to American uh, propaganda or television, uh, we live in a world where television would never show this series. The only reason we were on the air was Showtime, because I had a relationship with, and I was able to get it through, took it. They didn't pay for it. We had, we had to finance it. They took it. They played it. They didn't do a lot of advertising. HBO passed. Every other cable station passed. And you know, if you're an American, that every, we would never have gotten this on uh, network television. Never. Not in a million years. There's no challenging documentaries. Now, you can say 60 Minutes is all this, gets all the Emmy Awards, but I challenge you, would 60 Minutes ever run this kind of story about Hiroshima or Nagasaki or about any aspect of American history? They'll go into an occasional atrocity but they never give you that big pattern, that big picture of you, because they're pro-American. They depend on pro-American sponsorship. Business interests will not pay, corporations will not pay to be uh, critical of America too much. So we have a real roadblock, and our young people are not getting an education unless they go to other alternate means. We have to provide them that. The, the museum that Oliver is referring to in Nagasaki is the Okamasaharu Museum and we urge all of you to visit it. It's an incredibly eye-opening museum in Nagasaki and is ignored by, by the city officials. But Japan has an institution very alien to the United States known as peace museums. The United States has one peace museum, a little one, that's also in Dayton, Ohio, but it's not run by the same people who display boxcar. But we think that's essential. We need those kinds of museums that critically look at American history and uh, our big institutions. Oliver mentioned the Enola Gay controversy. Some of you remember that in 1995, and that it was censored. The Amer United States had censorship. The United States was not ready in 1995 to do an honest, balanced exhibit on the atomic bombings. What they did instead was a propaganda exhibit. And then in 2003, at the Air and Space Museum Annex, uh, near Dulles Airport in Virginia, they opened up this annex and displayed the Enola Gay. And we fought against that. We didn't fight against displaying it. We said it should be displayed, but it has to be done educationally. What do they do instead? They have no information about the dropping of the atomic bomb. They just give some details about the plane itself. You know, the plane is not exceptional. What's exceptional is what that plane did. This is 2003. Supposedly, we're so concerned about weapons of mass destruction. This is a plane that inaugurated the era of weapons of mass destruction, and the United States can't do an educational exhibit, an honest exhibit about that. Thank you. Uh, have, have you found the Japanese media receptive to your message about Japanese war atrocities, or have you been detected any censorship or reluctance to embrace the idea? Well, we've been getting an enormous amount of coverage, very positive coverage from Japanese media, but we see that the Japanese media is much more comfortable uh, explaining, articulating our critique of Hiroshima and Nagasaki because that fits into Japan's victim narrative. They've been less willing to cover our critique of Japan as a victimizer. So, so yes, the, the coverage has been positive and extensive, but we want to get this other side of the message out also. The, uh, the headline in the Nikkei Shimbun, which is important, was that Japan must confront its old, own untold history. And that's part of it, because America's untold history and Japan's untold his history go hand in hand together. They're part of the same 
process of obfuscating what really happened in the past. So we think that is both sides have to come, come together. Thank you. Peter, and then did I see another hand? Peter first, yeah. Yes, please, come up to the microphone. Did I see any other hands from the working press? Okay, Leon, okay. I'm a, my name's Peter O'Connor, I'm a historian of propaganda, and I kind of snuck onto the press, onto the press uh, table. A little louder, please. Uh, yeah. Peter, could you speak into the microphone? Sorry, I'm a, my name's Peter O'Connor, I'm a historian of propaganda uh, in East Asia. Um, and I've been asking my students over the years uh, at Worcester University and Musashna University to consider the, um, the relative um, status given to um, the firebombing of Tokyo as opposed to um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, at uh, Hiroshima, it was about 80,000 plus 120,000, and they're still suffering. At Nagasaki, it was about 26,000 and another 40,000 since. And that's debatable. It's as debatable as all figures are. Um, at, in Tokyo, in the eight months of the, of the final bombing um, of Tokyo, the fire bombing of Tokyo, um, it was about 500,000 over eight months and 10 million refugees um, left Tokyo. There's a, there's a very small monument to, to the bombing um, in Tokyo, um, and it was put up you know, during the last five years, whereas there's a, um, you know, Hiroshima, the, the, the mushroom cloud, um, the lunchbox, whatever, you know, the frozen, the frozen gut, um, watch, all of those things have been iconized um, to a huge extent. Now, I don't see this as a conspiracy any more than I see most Japanese politics as, and hi political history as a conspiracy. I don't see people, you know, the oligarchs getting together in the, in, in the back room, you know, with a blueprint. I think it's, it's a sort of cock-up kind of history, you know. But I would like to, I would like to see how you see that, because uh, I'm interested. So how do you see the Tokyo firebombing, the fact that it doesn't get as much attention as Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or anything near as much attention? I see that as... Uh, well, because, the, because Tokyo was the second pioneer, Germany was the first pioneer of civilian bombing at Guernica in 1936, and, 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 and Japan was the second pioneer uh, in Shanghai in 1937. And so Japan was not unique in that, but Japan was unique in being um, atomic bombed. And so I think that's the reason. But I don't know. You know. Uh, for, first, I, I guess I would have different numbers than you have for, sure. the, for the casualties in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in Tokyo, but uh, your point, I think, is an interesting and important one. I've been to the firebombing museum mm -hmm. in Tokyo, mm -hmm. which people should, should visit because it deals with some of that history. The, um, the United States, before the war started, uh, said, uh, we criticized the inhumane barbarism, Roosevelt did, of the firebombing of cities in Spain and in China. We said this was inhumane barbarism and no people should firebomb civilians. Uh, by the time the United States got seriously involved in the Pacific War, our policy was based on firebombing. We dropped, the bombs with loads we dropped were three quarters incendiaries designed simply to burn down cities and kill civilians. The American attitude was that there is no such thing as a civilian in Japan, and everybody is a fair target. And, and Curtis LeMay was the mastermind. He was honest about one thing. This was called terror bombing. It was terrorism. It was state-sponsored terrorism. We we're so upset about private terrorism, but this was sp state-sponsored terrorism, and it's a war crime. And Secretary of War Stimson said to Truman, in June of 1945, said, I'm so concerned about the firebombing of cities. He said, I don't want the United States to get the reputation for outdoing Hitler in atrocities. And that was the concern, this barbaric killing of Japanese civilians. And then the, then the Hiroshima bombing. The reason why I think the Hiroshima bombing deserves the prominence that it gets is because Truman understood before the bombs were dropped that this was, he was beginning a process that could end all life on the planet. The firebombing of cities was horrible, but it was not going to end all life on the planet. The nuclear age could. Robert Oppenheimer warned the leaders on May 31st, a couple months before the atomic bombs were dropped, that within three years, we're likely going to have bombs seven 
5,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. By 1954, Edward Teller was proposing a, a bomb that the U.S. should, the US should develop that was 700,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. We began a continuum with the firebombing of Tokyo on March 9th and 10th. We expanded it through the firebombing of cities that had no military relevance during the summer of 1945. 99.5% of the city of Toyama was destroyed. Uh, but the other interesting thing about it was the, chi the Japanese firebombing of Chinese cities was not raised at the Tokyo tribunals. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because if that was raised, it would have opened up the door to looking at the American firebombing of Japanese cities mm -hmm. and to the American atomic bombing, and, and many people would have understood the barbarity, which is why Oliver and I say, what if Germany had dropped that bomb first, mm -hmm. you know, instead of the United States? Mm -hmm. How the world would look at this as an act of the ultimate barbarity and hopefully nuclear weapons would have been eliminated. But instead, the United States dropped them, and nuclear weapons were looked upon as something necessary, and in the United States' case, something good and defensible. So I think your point is a valid one. There should be much more attention to the Tokyo firebombing and to the other firebombing. Uh, and, but it doesn't have to be counterposed mm -hmm. to the atomic bombing. We've got enough room in our memories and our study Absolutely. of history for both. Absolutely. Thank it's you. Not neither or. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see just gentlemen here in the middle, and then Peter down the back, yeah. Um, Obayas is my name, and uh, who it has. Uh, as well as its treatment of prisoners and people. And I'm told that if this museum were in Tokyo, that they would not be able to stay open, that they would be attacked by the right-wing thug organizations that exist in Japan. Well, uh, Peter was involved in the Smithsonian. I have to remind you of the Smithsonian Institute. There was a huge scandal in 1995 to have an exhibit on the Enola Gay. Uh, they objected to uh, various things that Peter and his people were trying to put into the exhibit, like the, uh, the lunchbox, uh, the melted lunchbox that you see at Hiroshima. They wouldn't allow that, and they wouldn't allow any... They, they said it was a disgrace to U.S. veterans. This is the kind of mentality. What we need in the U.S. is a simple museum like in Nagasaki, like the atomic museum that I saw there. It explains nuclear weapons, the amounts, the maps, what a nuclear weapon looks like. It has a... It shows you the size and the shape of the uh, plutonium bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. It gives a, a young person a real look into the power of the bomb, and it's a beautiful. We don't even have a nuclear museum in the U.S. As far as I know, Dayton, Ohio, Peter told me, there's a, there's a uh, museum in Dayton, Ohio, with boxcar, which is a plane. But there's no knowledge about what nuclear warfare can do. And, I, and in reference to American uh, propaganda or television, uh, we live in a world where television would never show this series. The only reason we were on the air was Showtime because I had a relationship with, and I was able to get it through, took it. They didn't pay for it. We had, we had to finance it. They took it. They played it. Pro-American sponsorship. Business interests will not pay. Corporations will not pay to be uh, critical of America too much. So we have a real roadblock, and our young people are not getting an education unless they go to other alternate means. We have to provide them that. The, the museum that Oliver is referring to in Nagasaki is the Okamasaharu Museum, and we urge all of you to visit it. It's an incredibly eye-opening museum in Nagasaki and is ignored by, by the city officials. But Japan had... They didn't do a lot of advertising. HBO passed. Every other cable station passed. And you know, if you're an American, that every, we would never have gotten this on uh, network television. Never. Not in a million years. There's no challenging documentaries. Now, you can say 60 Minutes is all this, gets all the Emmy Awards, but I challenge you, would 60 Minutes ever run this kind of story about Hiroshima or Nagasaki or about any aspect of American history? They'll go into an occasional atrocity, but they never give you that big pattern, that big picture view, because they're pro-American. They depend on 